All right, so we're now at 6.30 and I thought we'd begin the meeting. Um, the purpose of tonight's meeting, um, should we start with public comment? Do you want to facilitate or Bryce, or Bryce facilitate? Bryce, do you want to facilitate and then I'll be Yeah, the yeah, that's fine. Um, there's no amendments to the agenda as far as, as far as I'm concerned. So we can move right into public comment. If any members of the public are present, if you want to raise your Zoom hand and speak, now is the time. I'm attempting to raise my I'm trying to raise my Zoom hand, but I also couldn't get my video on. Sorry, everybody. Yeah. So go ahead. Um, I, just, I just am a little, I, I just actually, a um, point of clarification maybe, because I know that an email went out to the, the kids this week at school. They received an email saying that spectators would be allowed. And so I'm, I'm, I'm here um, and I would like to encourage everybody to vote yes for, for the spectator amendment, but I'm also a little confused if it's already a done deal or not. So I, I can, it, it, yeah. So th th throughout this whole process, um, the the only vote that the board has taken at all was that we have, um, you know, voted to give the superintendent the authority to make these decisions, right? So we don't have to micromanage every every step of the way. That was back in I want to say August, probably September, whatever that that meeting in that time frame was. So the superintendent has the ability to to you know make these um, decisions, and this is really uh, you know the the plan all along was to meet again before winter sports really started, and um, you know the she said when she announced the current plans a month or so ago that there would be they'd be reevaluating before you know even mid December so that you know it's been reevaluated Sherry's going to lay out the the current state of where administration is at and um, it's more than anything informational uh, and I think to solicit feedback from board members and to be able to hear the public and hear the viewpoints of all of the board members from all of our communities but we don't need to take a board action to implement what's what's happening right now, if that makes sense. That's great. Thank you. I thank you for the explanation. And, and I would just enthusiastically encourage, <laughs> encourage all of you to support um, Superintendent Sousa's recommendations um, on behalf of um, the varsity hockey teams. Thank you. Uh, Kurt. Hi, uh, Bryce. Uh, thank you. I am. Uh, I just have a quick question. Can you summarize what the decision was that we is being reevaluated tonight? Um, I mean, that's that's a lot. There's a lot of detail, and it's a couple of different topics, Kurt. I think it's probably best to just listen to Sherry's uh, kind of update, however she has it formatted. And if you have additional questions afterwards, maybe I can help you post post meeting or send you those materials from before maybe so you can compare if that would help. It just seems like a lot, sorry. So I have my hand up as a public citizen. So Jim Hatt has his hand up. All right, a, go ahead, Jim. Uh, um, just clarification on the board stance. I believe back in August, the board had said that they would take the recommendation of the superintendent with the superintendent coming forward to the board with board approval in some way also. Um, the action that we took. Backing to the superintendent on the decision. If we go back to August, I don't know if any other board members um, recall that at this time, but. Um, you can review the materials. The vote. The vote was to to authorize her to, to do that. That being said, I mean Sherry told us, and the intent has been all along that she would inform us as she goes and, and solicit that feedback. Um, if if there was an action that was taken, right, that the board was not in favor of, anybody can make a motion to, um, you know, change the procedure, do something. You, you know, do that's just not the role we've generally taken, but it's not out of question so she's presenting us with things she's taken feedback from the board all along and um you know present us everything along the way but we haven't had to take votes every time she's prevent presented us with these different things that have happened 
Okay, that clarifies. Somebody wants to make a vote, you know, make a motion. That that clarifies what I thought in the beginning. Yeah. So I'll wait yeah. to hear Terry's plan. Just to follow up on that, I I think it my understanding is it was somewhere in between, right? That yes, let's craft some policies and let's not micromanage that process, but let's get a heads up before something goes out to the public so that if some people don't agree with it, some people have a big problem with it, some people are really supportive of it, that can be worked into what was coming out. So there's some consistency here. I feel like um, we're kind of backed into a corner at this point, whereas if there's a whole lot of disagreement, what do we do? And that's just my, I thought we were probably more along the lines of where Jim was coming from, that there would be a heads up so that we could have a conversation before there's something that came out that's a that's drastically different than what we were planning on doing. Point of order, are we still in public comment? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I raised my hand as a public citizen. So, uh, yeah, no, understood. But we should probably get past public comment and get into yep. the business, Dan. I agree. Let's move into the the, the your sports plan, Sherry. All right, thank you. Um, as you remember, back at the beginning of November, myself, Garrett Smale, um, uh, Hannah Leland, and Jack Boimer, um, Katie Burke met to discuss um, prior to, just as we got the re recommendations from Secretary French regarding how we were going to do winter sports. And our first conversation, we really wanted to be conservative based on what we saw and in terms of the number of students in our buildings who were uh, COVID vaccinated um, and concerns we had about our ability to implement a plan where we could um, really make sure that people were in masks and doing the other things that the state had recommended. Since that time, and based on you know, feedback, and, and we always were considering that when we first put out that proposal, we said that we would review that decision at prior to winter break. So we never believed that that would be our final position, but it was our position to start with. And knowing that um, we could not anticipate the impact of Thanksgiving, we couldn't predict the number of students who were vaccinated. We had great conversations with uh, Kale at the Woodstock Rec Center and making sure that we had everything in place so that we could return to having sports as close to normal as possible and having families involved in spectators. So we met again, the same group, we had conversations, we looked at models from other districts, I spoke to superintendents from other districts, um, we spoke to our attorney about what we could and couldn't put into place. And based on that, uh, Garen and his team made recommendations regarding how can we allow spectators, how can we make sure our student athletes are healthy and also part of that conversation is, how can we have opportunities for our students that are healthy to get together and to see each other? Because one of the things that we're really seeing is that our high school, middle school students don't have healthy places to be and be together. And so as a result of that, we came up with a plan where each student athlete would have four season passes. Those would be given out. We would, with those passes, we would be able to collect who were attached to the passes. We would require mass of our athletes. We would ask that student athletes be vaccinated. If not, that they would do the weekly test to stay in the day of the game, have a test. Um, and that we would really make sure that um, any um, visiting teams would also have the four passes and that the coach of that team would give us a list of who was allowed to enter. Students, any student can attend, any faculty and staff can attend. And so, you know, Jack and Garen looking at our, our gymnasiums, which, and our, you know, arena, which building, which spaces had the capacity for those size of students. We know the middle school gym, we do not have that possibility. And so, you know, Jack is working on having some of our middle school basketball games in the big gym so that they can have some uh, spectators. At least I think Jack came up with, I think three or four, maybe a few more where the middle school teams could have some spectators. But we are limited by our building, uh, gymnasiums, and, and um, again, wanting to be healthy and safe. So I sent out that plan to students um, at the middle school, high schools. We have about 490 students 
I had 45 students respond. Of that, all were supportive of this plan. They are concerned. They worry about spectators, a few of them. Of the 45, I had about five that were concerned about spectators and making sure that we can stay safe. A few were, you know, uh, asked to not have to wear, wear a mask during theater presentations, those kinds of pieces. But of all the uh, students that reviewed the plan and responded to the survey, they were supportive. Um, last week, I sent out an a email to all the middle school and high school parents. Um, I received only supportive email except for one parent who was concerned um, by the number of students and the number of COVID positive in the state. Um, and, you know, in speaking with Katie Burke, that because we have such a high vaccination rate in our middle school and high school and in our communities that um, felt that it was, we were safe to bring spectators at that limited amount um, in both our theater productions as well as our sporting events. And I have the full portfolio if you want to see the screen, but I thought I'd give an overview. Um, and if people want specific questions, we can go through that um, actual proposal. So I've, uh, you know, so I've solicited input from our administration, from our um, internal health team, from uh, parents from the middle school and high school, and from the students of the middle school and high school. Questions? Can I have one question? Here? Sure, Matt has a question. Just, just so I'm clear, because sure. I've had this asked to me. Um, regardless of a parent's vaccination status under this correct they're able to go yes and watch their kids play yes okay. so no one will be checked at the door whether they're vaccinated or not they will be required to wear a mask but every student will have student athlete or a thespian will have four passes and we will have that list and then the events that they forget a pass we'll have a google doc and we can verify whether that person is is one of the uh, season pass holders uh, Anna? Ah, uh, you're muted. Can you unmute her right from there right There now? I am. Can you hear me now? Yes. Thank you for letting me know. I was hoping everybody could read my lips this evening. Um, I have a handful of questions. Um, I, in general, have a lot of concerns about this, and I think there are ways that we could tighten this up a little bit to make I think the the folks who are concerned, and I know there's a couple other board members who are concerned and, and definitely some emails coming in of concerned parents. Um, who's, so, so folks are gonna be required to be wearing a mask upon entry of the building. Will there be um, any staff there to enforce that? Like within the building? Because I know from my experience that even when there's a mask requirement, there are people that are still, um, you know, pushing pushing the boundaries and and not wanting to wear a mask and being very brazen about it. Jack or Garen, do you want to talk about that? Go ahead, Jack. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so, yeah, I will. I'm pretty much at every single game, um, and I'm always walking up and down. Um, you know, especially with indoor sports, it's it's and both our hockey and our um, and our basketball court it's all the fans are on one side um, of, so it's relatively easy to look up and see, Oh, that person is, you know, pulling their mask down and it's going to be very quick and um, it's not going to be messing around. It's going to be, if someone c cannot keep their mask on they're they're going to be out of there. And if it continues to be an issue, we will just say we don't have it. Like it's, it's um, I feel like it's a little to ask for you know, we all want to be able to have fans at these games. At least I, I certainly, I certainly do. So if, if that means that everyone has to wear a mask, like that should be the pr top priority for everyone to, to follow that. Um, you know, we had, we had our first uh, girls hockey game this Saturday and it was no issue at all. Everyone had their masks on students, um, parents. I think I, you know, the hope is, and, and I think it will come true is that everyone is so excited and, uh, you know, after, after a season, after last year, not being able to have any fans, people don't want to mess this up. So, um, so, you know, that being said, we, I'll be there. We'll have other administrators at, at some games. Um, so there will be folks that can, can monitor this. <clears throat> and that's one awesome. of the reasons we went with season passes. They are given out, they can be taken away. And so we're hoping that that's one of the levers we can pull if we have a non-compliant individual. 
Awesome. Yeah, I appreciate that clarity. Um, and uh, will there be masks uh, provided if folks forget them in their car? Um, we did have them at the hockey game last night. Uh, the Union Arena was nice enough to let us use. They had an extra stack. I think there was one student who did not bring one, and we and we just gave it to them right away. Um, so we can do that for basketball too. Uh, you know, you hope again. You want to give people the benefit of the doubt, and <laughs> that uh, they understand that pretty much anywhere you go inside, you should have a mask, uh, especially in schools, in school areas. Um, but we can have, yeah, we can provide masks if folks do forget i but I, I don't foresee it being like a huge you know that might happen like once per game if that okay yeah i hope that continues to to be so seamless um with the the testing for um negative results for participants um is that going to have a restriction on it like it needs to be in the past 24 hours or the past three days so they'll, they'll have weekly test to stay, and then the day of the game, they'll need to do a test to stay. Okay, great. It's just for the students that are not vaccinated, and so it's a small represented population of the student athletes. Yeah. Yeah, you know, uh, if I can be real frank here, um, I'm super happy with our vaccination rates, both of residents and citizens in general, but the students also. But I'm also very acutely aware that we still have, so Vermont leads the entire country in the cumulative percentage of pediatric cases right now of COVID. We are literally our number one in the 50, 49 states plus a couple of associated territories. Um, Vermont is number one. We're at 26% our children 19 and under. Granted, we have some of our kids that are above six now that are vaccinated, but we still have a whole cohort behind, under six that haven't been vaccinated. And granted, they may not be at the games, but if we see a local community outbreak, this is gonna affect everybody. And my main concern is for those children that haven't had the ability to be vaccinated. And it, I continuously see adults and myself included making decisions um, that really don't benefit you know, the whole community, it's, oh, well, I'm vaccinated, so I don't have to wear a mask. And, and we forget that even as a vaccinated person, we can still transmit that to somebody who's unvaccinated. And if you don't want to get a vaccine, that's great. But our littlest kids right now are not vaccinated. They haven't had the option to get vaccinated. And I think that's really important to think about with, with the, the smaller details that we could tighten up. So, and I'll stop there so that my fellow board members can speak up. Thanks, Anna. Go ahead, Bill. Yeah, so a couple of things. One, um, how are we working contact tracing, right? Is there a sign in or not? Um, what responsibility do the spectators have to uh, report back and who do they report back to? And I guess another question is, there was a data point that came out in an email from Bryce, I don't know if it was you to the community or Sherry to the community, that in our district, five towns are below the 80% threshold. And when we look at the percentage of students, piggybacks on honest point, in our elementary school who are not fully vaccinated, we're, we're well below kind of the thresholds we set out. And I guess my question is what's changed, right? How did we go from, uh, you know, where we were, a month ago, 60 days ago, to here? And have things gotten dramatically better or worse? And then I look at, you know, we've been having an ongoing conversation on the board for a while about the need for a new building. Um, and one of the main reasons for the new building is the air quality and the ventilation system are so poor to the point where we're asking the towns to sign up for a $70 million bond. Are we doing do we do we have a ventilation problem or do we not have a ventilation problem? How does that marry into or fit into this paradigm of let's bring people together, some who may not be vaccinated? We hear parents complaining about, don't keep my kids home from school because someone has the sniffles. Don't make them get tested because it's uncomfortable for them. Yet we're just, and we're, as Anna said, right, we're leading the charge here in positive percentage cases, and we're seeing um, COVID make an ugly return. And I just wonder, look, I'm all for spectators at sports, but are we really doing what's best for the community? And what's the backlash going to be when we say, oh, 
you know what, the fifth and sixth grade are home for two weeks. How have we thought about that? And what are we going to do because at home learning didn't work well last time? And what have we done as a district to strengthen our remote learning capabilities? And are we really prepared for that? So can I, I take the notes, Bill. I, I, hopefully I hit the three key points. So in terms of contact tracing, so if it's a spectator, that's the Department of Health. So if there's some, an incident within the building, within the uh, audience, then that's with the Department of Health, we would not be responsible for contact tracing. Um, every person who's coming in there, we will have a list because they'll have a season pass or we'll have a list from the opposing teams, spectators. Um, the only people we won't have a list on is students, but already students were at 80% uh, threshold for vaccination. So if it's a student athlete, we're in charge of the, so if someone on one of our sports teams um, or one of the or our students in the audience, then we're responsible for the impact within our building. Um, if it's someone in the audience, then it's the Department of Health for contact tracing. How do we get here? We've seen the evolution of what that 80% has done for us. So no longer, and it's very different. So I'm gonna talk about middle school, high school, and then I'll talk about elementary school. So at the middle school and high school, because we've exceeded the 80% threshold, we're not doing contact tracing anymore. We're doing the test to stay. If you've been in with the vicinity of someone COVID positive, if you're COVID positive, you're home. What we've seen because of that, and then we're one of the first middle schools and high schools that achieved that. Uh, when I emailed the Secretary French and asked about it, no one else had really achieved that threshold. What we've seen is we've been really able to keep our classes moving, our school going. I mean, it's amazing how few people have lost instructional time at the middle school and high school. Maybe Garen can speak to that specifically. Um, if we've had a, a teacher out, and again, very luckily, we've been able to cover, our teachers are covering for each other. So we've kept our school that has not impacted the middle school and high school. Elementary, it, it is a different situation. And that's what Gail and I see Joel's on the, on the call as well, have taken very seriously. Students who want to play rec center sports, it's really been broken down. So all the coaching or, or, or practices will be immediately after school. When a parent picks up, they'll be picking up outside the school building. All the coaches and Joel is here have been vaccinated and boosted. So we have, we have that going for us. They are also doing the vaccination requirement with the test to stay. Our school nurses will provide the coaches with that information. So we really are taking it very seriously. The, the, and again, fifth and six are the only ones that will be having games at Prosper Valley. And Joel, do you wanna talk about some of the mitigation strategies while you're here? Thank you for coming tonight. Uh, yes, can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, so I actually talked to Katie today as well um, and sent her a list of our rosters um, for the participants for third, fourth, and fifth, and sixth. Um, and she's going to let me know, you know, those those few families that aren't vaccinated who we need to keep up with, and then we'll direct them to uh, the places they can get tested and stuff. So, and then in terms of games, um, you know, we're going to keep that really limited. I think. Currently, we've only got four games scheduled for these groups. Um, we're not going to have, uh, you know, we're not going to have anybody foreign in the building, no parents, um, nobody else other than the coaches and the one official that we will have in the building. And uh, that would only happen, you know, twice, I think, at home um, in the Prosper Valley School. Everything else would be, you know, the only, the only person who's not in the building that would come in would be the coach. And at this point, at the fifth and sixth grade level, that's going to be me for both of those teams. So there's really only one person, and that's me, that would be coming in those buildings to coach those two teams. Um, with the third, oh, go ahead. Sorry, Joel. I think what the other thing has changed is I think our students need to have something that's positive and safe to do. They, you know, they're going to get together, right. and I know they want to go to their their friends' sporting events. They want to go to a hockey game on a Friday night. They need to have something that they're with other individuals that are mostly vaccinated. Um, if we don't provide them a place to be, they're going to find somewhere else and it's not going to have the level of supervision and the level of healthy individuals around them. And I, that's the other conversation that I know I've had with Karen and Jack and with Hannah. 
our kids sent me emails, our students, and they said very clearly, we need something. And we've worked really hard and gotten vaccinated. Can we have this? So I think that's the other part of the conversation that we haven't had when we first brought um, our, our guidelines to, to the table. And I, I know they need some place to go and it needs to be some place that we can control for a lot of things. Or do we have ventilation issues in our buildings? We have lots of different issues in our buildings, uh, our middle school and high school. Um, but I think that, you know, we're talking about the bigger space, you know, the gym has a lot more air. We, we have a lot of, we're only putting four uh, season passes to athlete. When you think about it, when you have a team of 20, that's 80 potential parents, our, our students who we know have a high vaccination, vaccination rate and possibly 80 fans. That's more than we usually have anyways at our sporting events. Garrett or Jack, anything else you wanna to add to the why? I guess another one to say is um, we're still leaning toward a more conservative approach than I'd say most schools in the state. Most schools in the state are moving toward a masking requirement, um, maybe some limitations on spectators. So we feel that we've made one that's uh, that still leans toward a conservative move with what Sherry's outlined about what are some restrictions to really keep a certain number of people there, um, how we can control on, on those people coming to the game. So I think as far as that shift from, from where we were at to what this is, I think they should see it as still leaning toward a more conservative approach to uh, keeping the safe place. I guess what I want to say finally is, I, and I think we've come to learn that this is our third school year in a pandemic. We have to be ready to shift and we have to respond to what we see in front of us. And if things change, absolutely, I'll be coming back to the board and saying, we tried it and it's not working or guess what? It's working really well and we're going to be, so I'm hopeful that the board will continue to have our, the capacity to shift. There is, we have no prediction. I mean, I predicted last June that we would be coming back and all we have to worry about is mass. Oh, I wish that was the case, but things are shifting constantly. And so our plans will shift. And I think our parents have come to expect and, and, and they're rolling with it. And so are our students because we would never have predicted a year ago that we would be here. So uh, just, just, just one more just thing that. was pointed, Bill, to you in the L that you continue just because there was one thing that wasn't answered. You, you brought up the, lower rate of vaccinations in, in our towns. And I am the one that found that data point. Though the state site didn't call out our specific towns, I did do some more digging and the, the methodology, because I was questioning, so so Bethel and South Railton, for example, look really, really high, right? They look like they're 90%, and I think Barnard was 60%. They, they are only using zip codes for that methodology. So um, the towns in our district that were skewed really low were next to towns like that, like a lot of Barnard residents. I myself am in Bethel zip code, even though I'm right in Barnard Village. Um, so I think a lot of them are being pulled uh, in that way. So if you look at the map, there, there, that was a very common trait that made a lot of sense. So th that's probably inaccurate. So not saying that I know the answer to what those percentages are, but I have a feeling they skewed very low because of that reason. And I have no way to actually tell and the state is not providing any additional information on that. So. I just to speak to that one point since you brought it up, but go ahead. Yeah, right. I, I guess what I'm getting at is I think since the November emails have come out and we said we'd look at this later on, things have gotten worse, not better in, in terms of COVID spreading through the community, especially in the middle school uh, and elementary schools. And I get that, yes, our, our high school, um, and when I say middle school, I meant the fifth and sixth grade, sorry, right? But the high school and middle school might be doing fine, but they have younger siblings who are being affected. And I, the real meat of the question here is, what have we done? So if we have to, right, I'm, I'm trying to plan for the future here. If we have to do something where an entire grade is out for a certain number of days, what are we doing to make sure that they're getting the lessons that they would be getting in school? Because we've heard about how devastating it is and how the distance learning just wasn't working. So. Could you, have we planned for what could happen? So we or are we just kind of saying, we don't think it's going to, so we're not going to do anything about it. And I don't mean that in a negative way, it just came out, but it's kind of like, what, what's, the, what's the game plan here if things go south and we've got to keep the kids home? Okay, so we can't do remote because we're no longer in a state of emergency. So that is not an option. So we've had um, numbers of different classrooms. And so we've supported, if a student is tested positive, then they have the seven days out with a test and then able to return. 
those kids, students that are not vaccinated and have been in a classroom, so we don't have to wipe out a whole classroom anymore. The students vaccinated, they can still come to school. If a student's not vaccinated and been in the presence of a student who was positive, they can do tests to stay. So we have more options on the table, more tools in our toolkit, so we don't lose whole classrooms. I mean, this last week was the first COVID event we've had at Prosper Valley, and it was four or five kids. So that's the most we've seen out of a student, a school of 95 kids. So our test to stay protocol, the number of kids that are vaccinated, it's working in a way that it's not working in another district. Sorry, I, I don't, I don't, I don't mean to dig in on the point, but I don't think that really answered the question. So what did we do for those five students who were out for a week? And what happened? And that was before we opened up to people from outside the, the bubble, if you will, coming in. That what so what do we what did we do for those students? Was it just you're out for five days, six days, three days, whatever it is, and you can catch up? That doesn't seem like it's a good solution. That's what it is. So we are, you know, teachers are providing work, we're providing assignments. I don't know if people are videoing in. That hasn't been, uh, you know, we haven't had a lot of success for that. The primary way we've been doing is providing resources and materials home to students so that they can stay current with their classes. Garen, do you want to talk? I mean, you've had some number of students out. Yeah, we actually haven't had a number of students out for some time since we've we've hit the, the vaccination rate and been able to change our protocols because we're only having students who need to stay out who are who are positive, and that's been, been very few. Um, so with those individualized cases, as, as Sherry described, it, it's a close contact. So we haven't had the situation that, that Bill, you've raised about a whole classroom, which makes much larger numbers, but with a specific numbers of keeping kids going. Um, we also haven't seen, um, we haven't seen, well, I was gonna say as far as like the spread is the data where we see events like this leading to kind of a content spread. But I guess what I'd say in short, just as, as Sherry raised, we because of our shift in protocols, um, according to state standards, uh, we haven't had wide swaths of students out for numerous days. So that was something that fortunately we're not, we're not grappling with right now. All right, Adam, why don't you go ahead? Yeah, uh, um, I gotta say, I'm pretty concerned um, with the idea. Um, I mean, did anybody see rates of uh, COVID infections in the last week, including this weekend, of over 700 in our state. Um, I'm really concerned about the implications it has for, for students in education, which is our priority and as a school board. Uh, I think there's also these implications it has as people have referenced of community implica implications. Um, but I work in healthcare and ask a healthcare provider how they feel about continuing to swab people on a regular basis um, continuing to have to deal with like, you know, as a state, we're starting to close beds for hospitalization, right? On, on face value, this just, we're not saying don't play sports. That's not what we're saying right now. Um, or that that's not what I'm, I'm suggesting, right? I'm suggesting that we need to be really wise about this because um, it's quite concerning about the implications as, as Bill kind of referenced of, uh, or others have referenced too, of like, this has all the potential for going in the wrong direction while rates are going in the wrong direction in our state. Um, you know, when emails, when we got, I think I got over 30 emails when this, when you put out the first policy, um, Sherry, um, these emails kept coming in as our rates kept going up in the state and people seem to kind of be disregarding like, well, if you're vaccinated, you're okay. And that's, that's not the truth. Um, we have healthcare providers that are vaccinated that are getting COVID. Um, this is just, it's in my opinion, I, I love sports. I support sports. My kids play sports. I love, you know, I think it's really important. We're not saying don't play them. I'm not saying don't play them, but I just don't think this is a wise move right now. Um, it, this has implications so much broader than um, being able to watch a child play a sport or watch our peers play sports. Um, I, I just disagree with the idea. Thanks, Adam. Uh, go ahead, Sarah. Okay. Uh, yes, I, I had a couple questions too. I'm also very concerned, um, especially about the 
I guess the, the, it really did seem like quite a leap to go from nothing to what feels like a almost a free for all. Um, and I'm not I'm not opposed. To all of it. Yeah, we can't hear your you. Mic is out. out. Your mic's out, Sarah. Your microphone's not working. Maybe we can come back to you. Why don't, why don't we go to Todd and we'll come back to Sarah? Or can you put it in the chat, Sarah, maybe too? I, I, my internet went a little glitchy. Do we? Did we? Uh, first of all, hello everybody. My uh, Bill, do we hear the answer on what when a kid goes home with COVID or won't submit to testing? What do they do at home for the week or two? Uh, that that's, I have a couple questions about that. Did we get the answer to that? So my the way I took the answer was they'll give them some lessons to work on at home. Okay, so that's that's not great, but they're right. right. Um, so I I went back and forth in this completely opposed completely for it, everything in between because there's clearly no right answer because if we had sports and everyone was healthy and happy and it all worked out we'd be like that was the best idea ever but no one wants a kid to die and no one wants people to be out of school and the worst thing is i think beyond the education of our children is thinking about their their parents and the folks that might have a single family with one parent that they have a job and they can't take care of that child. Like we saw that have devastating effects uh, with people trying to care for children when they have jobs. Um, and it just doesn't, it doesn't work for a lot of folks. Um, I think that I did see in my own life, the test at home, uh, my family and I went out of state, we came back, we followed the rules uh, and my son, one of the two, uh, they had a positive COVID case in the, in the school, uh, in the class. And all the kids did the test at, uh, the test at uh, whatever we're calling it, that where they go to school and they have the testing, rapid testing, PCR, all that. And only one, uh, two kids out of the whole didn't come back. So maybe one didn't take the thing or not, but we know one had it, right? But I think it was a, a great thing. But I did think about what would we do with Charlie, uh, the one kid in the class, if he had it, he didn't have it. But a lot of kids didn't. So I'm wondering, you know, we go back to this thing about transmission and all these things. Like, no one knows anything. We're three years in, like, like Superintendent Sherry said, then we really don't have any real answers. So I think what we're seeing here was a very um, poignant push toward the safest method. Um, and now we're seeing a push toward accommodation and trying to help uh, parents and children, mental health alike uh, is important. Um, I have uh, people that I've spoke to in the community that have come to me in tears saying they'll be playing their last hockey game. And if someone doesn't watch them, they just, that, you know, it, to me, I don't feel like they feel, but this is how they feel, um, our babysitters this way. Um, I think I think we all need to understand that no one's gonna be happy with anything we do, but we do owe the safety and success of our children's education and the people that teach them and take care of them should be first and foremost. Um, with that said, um, I just fear that without massive testing, you know, how are we going to not have Bill's worst version of every kid going home? I don't think that'll happen, but I don't know anything because I'm making that up, just like we all are with best intentions. So I guess a long way of saying that I emphasize with what Bill's saying, um, I don't think I fully am at the level Bill might be at, um, but it's just, it's a crapshoot. And should we be having this crapshoot with our children's health and education uh, because of backlash of the community? And who do we represent? The children of the community. It's it's a tough question, and I love to get answers from my colleagues. Garen, do you want to speak to that? Yeah, I um, I guess I want to speak a little bit to. I think there's a sense that that we are. That, I guess what I hear students saying is what we're asking students to do is sometimes incongruent with what they're having in other settings. We got to remember people are attending church services, people are attending concerts in other places, people are attending movies, these sort of things. So the community, people are experiencing these things. And, and what students are saying to me and where it's feeling increasingly 
um, frustrating to them, and I think really causing some tension in school, is that their experience in schools, which have been quite safe places, the, the spread in schools is very rare in the state, where we see people getting COVID and contracting COVID, uh, is not frequently in a school environment. Um, we haven't had any spread within our building. And so what they say to me and they speak about is, how is it that that other places in the community, again, people are doing these other things as I mentioned before, um, and and then at the same time, the school is in this very lockdown sort of place. So I, I just wanna remind people that we are in school daily with students, uh, students following the rules. Uh, they're doing the things to make it so they can be participants in these things. And I would encourage us to think about and entrust our students a bit to to that they can take that measure and want to take the responsibility to make this effective and work well for them. Um, again, they're in a, a pretty disempowered place. You know, we're talking about young adults here and we're looking at older adolescents um, and they're in a pretty disempowered place where what are the actions that they can do that they can hear, be heard by their community and their leaders that can say, okay, we can entrust you to do these things that are important to you. Um, so I think it's important again to think about the school environment, which we do control, but we're only a small piece of a much larger environment in which these kids live. Um, so I'd encourage us to think about that too. Uh, Sarah, if your mic is good now. No. All right, I would encourage you to put the, maybe put a comment or question into the, into the chat and I'll go to, go to Matt. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Uh, thanks, I'm Matt Stout, I'm your newest board member representing Woodstock. Um, I think it's a great conversation. I, I'm hearing some things that are helping me formulate my own opinion and ideas. Um, I do think it's important as we discuss it to differentiate the, the two policies, what's being proposed at uh, the elementary schools to allow the rec center to use the buildings versus the spectator policy and, and seven through 12. Um, I, I think if you, if you look carefully at the details for what the rec center has proposed and what uh, Sherry has is put in writing, it, it's it's very conservative. It's it's not allowing anyone but um, three coaches who vaccinated into the building. And uh, in a way, I think it incentivizes uh, parents to get their kids vaccinated because it's part of the requirement to participate. Uh, we're talking about kids going from their classrooms into the gym after school, a gym where they've already had uh, PE during the day in mask playing basketball. So it seems odd to deny them of that after school. It's also a sport that allows some kids without means who can't afford skiing or travel to hockey games uh, if their parents can't support that. Um, so I would hate to, to sort of penalize one group by not allowing them to have their sport. Um, and then with respect to, so I'm supportive of the, the, the plan. I think it's very conservative at the same time, I think very meaningful. So very little risk added, but huge benefit for that population of students. Um, at, with the spectator policy, I just had at, at the seven through 12 level, since there is no spectating allowed at the rec center games, um, it, in the written policy, it said that the, the, the opposing team would show up with a roster of players, but it didn't explicitly state that that roster would have the four uh, additional members of the audience. So I thought that would be very difficult to enforce if you didn't also collect the additional four audience members. So that's just a clarifying question. But I think if, if ultimately you're allowing, allowing limited capacity for spectators, I think it's a pretty good compromise. Jack, do you want to speak to the opposing team fans in that process? Yeah, so it's pretty simple. We're going to have um, the opposing athletic director will send me their roster, which they do anyway. I, I print out um, programs for, for every game. And our person, our, usually we're going to hopefully have two people at the door. Um, and like, again, it's nice that we have the example of this past weekend uh, to, to go on. And for anyone who was there, which I'm not sure if anyone was there that's in this, uh, in this meeting right now, but it went super smoothly, uh, felt very safe. Everyone was very happy. 
Um, but anyway, so we get there. It's going to be a tally system. So simply going to, when, when a visiting fan comes, you say, which athlete are you here for? They, it's usually most likely going to be a parent, but whoever it has, and each kid gets four. So once you, once they reach that number, that's it. Um, so it's pretty simple in that way. Um, and like I said, it, it works very well um, for the first, for the first game. So. Jim half his hand. Go ahead, Jim. Someone else has hands up. Um, is it unlimited children allowed, or students or athletes allowed? Uh, students from the other schools also, just like our school. So we're allowed to. I have a few questions. One, we're allowing our athletes, or we're allowing all our students, if they want to, show up to the game. Yeah. Okay. Correct. We're at 80% vaccination, let's say through 7 through 12. Yes. It may be the only game in town and the only thing for them to go to. Yeah. So you can have a lot more people than you want if it's every night. We're only at 80%. Middlebury High School, Middlebury College is at 99% vaccination. They just shut their school down to remote only learning. And I believe they shut all athletics off. My daughter, two daughters go to Smith College. They are at a hundred percent. In order to go to Smith, you have to be vaccinated. They are tested twice a week this whole first semester. And they now are having somewhere around 70 students that are in hotels in separate rooms for two weeks, Bill. Um, I believe we all, all, all are in this for 20 months now. I have been non-COVID for 19 months. I have shown up to the meetings here. I wear my mask. I find it kind of funny that we're talking about allowing other people into our buildings. Yet we as a board, there's only three members here. We're not allowed in the high school at all. We're here at the superintendent's office. Early November, someone had a cough that was around me, said they were okay. Turned out they were not okay. I tested positive for COVID. My wife tested positive for COVID. Unfortunately, my daughter, youngest, of three, I picked up that Friday night because she wanted to come home. She went back to school. She tested positive. She was put into a hotel for two weeks. Everything seemed to be going great. I hear that the game the other day went great, but we don't have the two weeks after yet. It went great. We have no control of the students that are coming over or the athletes from the other teams. We don't know if they're vaccinated or not. We're doing a great job in Windsor Supervisory Union, or whatever we're gonna call ourselves after this meeting, if the next one, if we get to it. Um, but what we're doing is, is we're going to allow spectators from other towns that maybe aren't doing as great. And we had a plan. We left it with the superintendent. Sorry, Sherry. Sherry knows where, I'm, where I come from. We had a plan and we said we were going to revisit this. Not this week. We weren't going to have open sports for spectators this week or this past week. We just wanted to get through the holidays and then come back and revisit. The numbers that you're presenting to me today or the, the decision that you've changed is because of, I'm sorry, Adam, I think you said 30 emails. I think I got about 150 emails. Um, I feel like we were pressured into this and we're not gonna say that. I have some questions about 
support staff because who's going to have to clean up after the games? They're already stressed. I am the chair of buildings and grounds. Our guys and ladies are already stretched, working around the clock, taking care of things. We talk about students doing the right thing. I'm not going to do it now, but the pictures of our building and inside of our building is disgusting. They're pissing in our bathrooms on the countertops. And we're going to let spectators come in from other areas and see what's going on because, I don't know, maybe they're in rebellion because we won't let them do certain things. I think this is a terrible idea. I could sit here and say, I don't believe in COVID. Okay, if I want to say that, I can say, I don't believe in COVID. The problem is, folks, if I really don't believe in COVID, it doesn't matter. AOE has certain restrictions or rules. CDC has certain restrictions and rules. And if our kid gets sick, I don't have any kids in this school system anymore. My last graduated last year. But if your child gets sick, they're out for a minimum of seven days. I, I just don't understand why we had to call a special meeting when we had a plan. Other than parents and students got us in emails. I hope that all the board members here will at least come through with our newest board member, Matt, and Todd, okay, and they're thinking of this. The elementary schools with just the coaches and letting the kids play, great. Continue to do that with middle school and high school because some of those players or some of those fans are going to go back where there is a child that's four years old or three years old because I believe vaccinations right now is five. <clears throat> a lot of people that have middle school and high school kids somehow have interactions with younger kids. We are a community. This community is doing great, but not all communities are doing great. So let's open up our doors. Let's, we don't know what the vaccination rate is. Let's say we're gonna play against Montpelier next week. What's the vaccination rate? I don't know. What's the vaccination rate of the students? We're 80%, 80% of what? 80% of 500? But what are we percentage-wise of the hockey team? What are we percentage of the basketball? What about the fans that show up? What's the percentage there? Maybe the 20% that's not vaccinated are the ones that show up to the game. Why are we doing this? And I'm gonna stop. Well, I, I, I think that at least maybe Garen can speak to the, uh, as far as being pressured by emails, Jim. I mean, the, I think that- uh, We called a special meeting, Bryce, based on emails. So Sherry spoke to the reason why the change in direction from the administration and Garen and Jack are kind of here to be able to speak to that as well. So again, I don't know if you have anything else to follow up with Garen, but, um, but I just wanted to clarify that, that point. Right. I just want to say, there, just a couple Go ahead, Sherry. So we are not allowing students from other schools, only our own students. But I want to be clear, I was given the direction. Oh, can, can just, stop? Jim, let me just... four, four, four fans are allowed to come with each athlete from out of, are you saying they can only be adults? What if they're four students? You my, just said my understanding was adults. So it was adult spectators. That's my understanding wasn't students, but we can clarify that. So I was asked to gather feedback from our medical team. So I spoke with Katie Burke, who spoke with our di district physician, they did not have an issue with spectators. You asked me to survey the students. I surveyed the students. I surveyed all the parents. 
So I, I was asked to collect information and bring feedback to this team, to the board, which I did. The feedback that I've received from the medical team, from parents and from students is asking for spectators to be present. I, I will listen to the board, absolutely. I, this is not being defensive, but I'm just saying that I was asked to do a task I was asked to be flexible in my, you know, how we make these decisions. Of all the decisions I'm making day to day, I'm sorry, winter sports is not the top priority of the things that I have to worry about in my schools. So but I did those tasks, I sent up the surveys, I collected information. So it is up to the board if they support the plan or not. I mean, Garen and, and Jack and I and Hannah and Katie can go back and revise the plan. But I want to be clear, this is, based on the feedback that I've received. And yes, I've received lots of parent emails, but I also had lots of conversations with students. I've had conversations with other people in the team. So this is not just for my, and I spoke to superintendents in other districts. Our athletes are being held to a different standard than all the other towns surrounding us and the other places they're going. We have really good kids. There are things happening in our building, absolutely. But this is a whole different presentation and it's because of COVID and having been out of school and not having things to look forward to and have fun with. And we're, our kids are impacted by that. Um, so I, I just, I, this is not a personal agenda. This is not something I'm gonna live and die for, but I was asked to do a certain task. I've done those tasks. I'm bringing that feedback to you. I absolutely understand the numbers are out of control in Vermont. WCSU, we have done some really good things for our families and our students, and we understand the expectations. But our students do need to have something they can look forward to. So that's why I know Garen and Jack and Hannah brought that plan to me and why I was bringing it to you and the board and the community. Uh, and, and Sherry, I am not questioning your capability or whatever. We have a plan is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. And we were not supposed to be meeting today. We were gonna get closer to the end of next week or something like that before the break okay and then thinking going on break but we've already started having spectators allowed as i have heard okay so there was a change in plans as bill has mentioned before and i had mentioned that i thought these things would have been gone to us at first um you keep on saying we're doing a great job but once again i don't know how great of a job other schools are doing that are going to be coming here. Let's and let Jack speak to that a little bit too, Jim. I'm almost done here. You know, as far as someone saying it may be, and I'm Jimmy, it may be Jimmy's last hockey game, and I've played hockey all my life, except for these last two days, two years, okay? I used to play over here at Woodstock. I played down on pickup in Rutland, but I have not played in two years. It's very hard to play hockey with a mask on. I know a lot of people put their mask now underneath their nose. They think that works. But where I'm coming with this is, it, it, it's just, can we just wait? I thought I was doing everything right. I came home, I infected my wife, I infected a, 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 a child of mine, I had to sit in a hotel room for two weeks. We all came, we're all gonna go away for the holidays. So let's get together these last 10 days and let's cross the different school districts with spectators and then enjoy our Christmas. And maybe it's Jimmy's last hockey game. All right, Jimmy. Jimmy may not be around. Let's let Jack respond, please. Yeah, so just for a quick um, point of reference, so basically the high school, just well, I'll use hockey and basketball, high school, they each have 20 games, 20 home, 20 away. So of the 10 away games that we have, I'd, I think it's, it's between 85 and 90% of them are full, full spectators. Um, the large majority of the, the schools in Vermont are going with full spectators. Um, so we have a, obviously have a more conservative plan than that, but my point is, so do you want me to, or do you want us to tell our our fans to not travel and and obey the rules that all these other schools are going with? That like it's going to be the same. So all of our fans are going to travel to these other schools and watch these games um, because their schools are allowing spectators. So us, even 
So if we were the one school in the state that decided we're, we're, we're closing the doors, we're not allowing any spectators, that would only, in theory, protect us uh, for those 10 home games. We still have 10 away games that no one's going to feel comfortable telling parents and fans to, to, to not go to those away games because we, we at Woodstock have a different theory than, than the rest of the towns uh, in the state. Um, so I just don't think that us, you know, make it, taking a stand and not allowing spectators would really, um, I don't think it, you know, would have the giant effect um, theoretically. And, and again, all, all these like ideas are theoretical, you know, it, uh, yes, anything we're living in, in the midst of COVID and, and like Todd was saying, we're all doing our best to, <laughs> none of us know what is exactly right to do. None of us are, uh, you know, we're, we're put with, with these tax tasks and we want to do what's best for the community and for our kids. And I think, you know, trying to weigh that's a very difficult thing, but that's what we're in a lot of ways. That's what we're doing. We, we see the mental health of these, of these students. Um, and like Sherry's saying, they need a safe space that they can have some sort of normalcy. Um, so that's my two cents on that. Aaron, so, so Jack, I, I follow you. I just want to respond to Jack. I, I follow your logic and I hear what you're saying, but as a board, we can only vote to what is, ha is happening in our schools, right? We have no control what happens across the state and in other schools. Um, and you keep using the word theory. This is not theory. This is, this is data, yeah. right? That over 700 cases in our state, right? Like we're running out of hospital beds. This is not, this is not theoretical. Like this is realistic. And, it it just um, it's it's a risk that that we'd be uh, voting to take. Right, uh, Ben, and then Josh will be up next. Sure, I'm, I'm, my thoughts are are aligned with with our newest board members, um, not because we spoke about it, but just um, um, I, mean, I guess where I, I I come out on this is um, unlike a year ago. Right, we have some real tools at our disposal and some data to back it that they they can be effective. Right. And that there are real consequences on both sides of this issue, right? You've got real mental health impacts for, you know, kids who aren't able to participate in in um, uh, sports. I think the the move to allow elementary basketball is wonderful, right? And that there are uh, with the, uh, and the, and on the other side of the aisle, you've got you know one of our board members just spoke to the fact that he and his family have just had COVID, right? That's incredibly real. But with these tools, I think it's worth a chance, worth a shot, and we can we can strike a balance uh, between you know minimizing both of those bad outcomes: um, vaccination, masks, social distancing. These things work, and we are we have a policy that employs them all. And I think um, the most important thing that uh, as Sherry has mentioned is flexibility. That if we find that um, you know having uh, spectators at hockey games or at youth basketball, or not necessarily spectators, but having youth basketball is a is a is a vector, then we can shut them down. But until um, we have an indication that that's the case, uh, I say we we move forward cautiously. Go ahead, Josh. So I mean, I look at it and I think that we. We have a good plan in place. We're taking all the precautions we can, but we need to be willing to take to take a chance. I mean, we've been in this for 20 months, and we've done decent so far. But if we we're not getting anything if we don't at least allow the kids to have something. That's just my thoughts. Josh, I uh, go back to Anna, and then Billy will be up next couple more comments and hi so I am a parent of a student that plays hockey outside of the Woodstock uh, town but I, I'm, when so, we're I'm sorry yeah. and I thought it was a, I thought it was our board member on I'm gonna have to to have you wait until public comment at the end it's only only board members right now apologies go ahead Bill yeah so I I'm um Fully supportive of what's going on the the elementary schools, right? I think that's that's great, um, as Matt Stout pointed out, right? That it makes perfect sense. 
is the compromise here because i've heard um and i do um concur with we've got to give the students something um why don't we open it up to our own students first and see how that goes right is that a is that a compromise here versus allowing people from across the state to come in where we don't we control less if you will we've done a great job in our district we're doing a good job in our district where you know what's the difference there and I, I don't want to minimize it but i remember something my father always said to me with and i would come home with something that i wanted to do that he may not have been so supportive of he goes well if all your friends are jumping off the brooklyn bridge would you do it right we've worked really hard in our district to keep our schools open to keep the kids there to keep them safe i just think that there's a there's a middle ground here right let's start with allowing students to come to the games um that that'd be my suggestion I don't see any more board hands. Um, just as a reminder, uh, I don't know if Sherry, if you want to speak uh, at all to any of these uh, last uh, section of comments. Um, if someone would like to make a motion, that's that's an available option. And if Sherry wants to speak to anything, that's also a you know an option right now. So, Bryce, I got my hand up. I'm not going to make a motion at this point, but what I think Sherry is looking for is feedback from the board. I don't know how many members of the board are here. I, I don't have the count. I see there's 23 participants and I gather we're one of the 23. Um, I, I think we need, we're, not we're not, well, we can vote. We can vote. I can make a motion. Um, you know, we're the board. Um, I kind of feel, I'm sorry, Sherry, but we've already made the change in plans. We've already allowed a game or two or whatever. We've already allowed spectators. You're looking for feedback from the board now. And I think we should, you know, I'm going to just say a roll call. I think listening to everybody, what Bill had just said, first allowing students of our own school going to our home games is a great idea for the middle school. I think that's common ground. I believe that will give this, the, the athletes the cheering in the audience or, or the stadium, whatever you wanna call it, a good try for now until we come back from our Christmas break, holidays, or some of them call it that. Um, and I'm gonna give a roll call that, I would support that, not the current plan. I would support the students first. And if we could just do a roll call, it's not a motion, Bryce, it's a roll call. So Sherry would get an idea. If you want me making a motion, I will. Can I, can let's I ask let, that first? Let's let Bill, Bill talk. Unless, is that Matt? Is that somebody I can't hear? Is there somebody? Matt? Yeah. Go ahead, Matt. So, Go ahead, Matt. Uh, when you had uh, the hockey and four people were allowed per person, were all of those opportunities filled like with were there students who only had like two people show up or one person show up did, or was it all four for everybody um it was not it was not even close to being filled which I, that's another <laughs> you know our our games only really we only get so many fans at a game pre-covid you know what i mean I, I played basketball at woodstock um you know, it's not like it's not like we're playing uh, Friday Night Lights in, in Texas, uh, where we have a full stadium. Um, Joel Carey can speak to this too. It's it's, you know, I think if people feel you know, if they don't want to go, they don't have to go for one thing. And and another thing is that, yeah, no, just to simply answer, no, we did not have all four spectators, especially for the away the away team had, I think they had like. 10 fans all together. They really, they, it, granted it was Miss Siskoi, which is, you know, that's a long trip. So only a few of them made the trip, but yeah, it was, it was not a packed uh, house by any means. Thank you. Well, and then Sam. Yeah, I, I, I will make a motion um, that we ask to have some data presented as to what the trends are in our specific district 
as well as to look at a compromise solution here. And if what the trends got? aren't supporting what we're, um, what we're offering, right? If, if we're going in the opposite direction from when we rolled out the initial plan, I would really ask, why are we changing it if things are getting worse? So I don't know, I don't know the right way to put that into a motion, but that's, that's kind of my thought. Asking I'm going to make, can I make a motion, Bill, that we hold off on the current plan and go back to the old plan until we get the bill is asking for? That's my motion. Do I hear a second? What's that? My, my motion is that we go back to the original plan that we had a month ago until we get the data that Bill is asking for and the board to come back with our input at that point. Do I Jim, I, yeah, can I just, can I fine tune that a little bit? I, sure. I'm happy to allow the fifth and sixth graders to have their programs because it's, it's contained, right? We're not, I'm only we're not middle school, high school where it's the spectators. I'm sorry. Yep. I'm not concerned about the fifth and sixth grade where it's just contained to them. This is in reference to middle school and high school. You know, we stick to the same program as fifth and sixth grade until we get the data that Bill is asking for. What data is being requested? Yeah, there's, there, 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 there's, some, there's so many different conversations going on, Jim. Hold on. So there's there's a lot of there's a lot of talk. And if there's going to be any emotion, it needs to be a lot more a lot more concise. Um, you know, because we're gonna to have to take High school follow the same as fifth and sixth grade until we get the data back that Bill is asking for. That's my motion. Do I have a second? If nobody's got a second, then no, 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 Jim. I, I, can I just build on that? And I think we can get somewhere. I'd like to make the motion that we allow the fifth and sixth grade program to go forward. Uh, we allow our own students to be spectators, but hold off on opening up uh, the doors to the visiting side until we have some more data. I'll second that. Motion, uh, Bryce. All right, there's, 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 there's a second. So do you have discussion about the motion on the floor right now? Can, um, can I speak? I've had my hand up for a while and- Go ahead, go ahead back Sam. Back and forth. Um, first of all, I don't even think the policy that we have in place currently even has it for us to, as the board, I mean, I believe as a board, we can vote on a suggestion that we are giving to Sherry, but as policy stands, Sherry has the authority with the data that she has put together to uh, put, put in place a plan with, with or without our approval. If I'm incorrect on that, somebody can correct me. But that is my impression. We can, of course, vote and have this motion that, that this is our suggestion. But this is not for us to be voting that we can change the policy. First, and foremost, first and foremost is what I would like to say. Second of all, um, I think what Matt said about, you know, really focusing on the differences of, you know, spectators versus the elementary school is something that needs to be acknowledged um, even more. I, it is very important that our elementary age stu students have um, a healthy athletic um, winter sport. I mean, we live in a state that is got snow majority of the year, their abilities to be active and social are limited. So us providing that and making sure that happens is very important to me and to our community. Um, whether we have spectators or not is, of, I think, as you know, Sherry and Garen pointed out, we are seeing, you know, the results in our school of the social 
an emotional toll this pandemic is putting on has been putting on the children and and you know we are seeing that results um in the bathrooms and in a lot of other behaviors now could we maybe limit it to two people rather than four that i feel could be a a nice uh compromise but as it stands our this this plan is much more conservative conservative than that of the rest of the state um and then i just also have um a question for jack to see if you could give me some clarification on it um for students playing from other school districts are are they is there any kind of by the state like requirements regarding vaccination or testing i know we're um requiring vaccination and or testing um is that for us or is that statewide um for other districts and because that would be a more of a concern for me you know of the students they're playing with um if that can't if it's not being provided that the, those students are either vaccinated and or have been tested recently. Um, thank you so much. Uh, Todd? Could I ask that you please allow people who are in the waiting room in there? I'm getting messages that people are trying to get into the meeting and aren't able to get in. I, I have nobody in the meeting room, Nicole. Maybe thank you. On the, the, wrong, the wrong meeting, maybe. There's another meeting that was supposed to start at 730. They could be looking at the wrong one. There's nobody in the waiting room to this meeting. Go ahead, Todd. Um, I mean, this is, again, I'm just going to state this is, is all so easy. I don't know why we're still on this call, right? Um, in show business, uh, it's obviously an incredibly large industry, and I've been a producer for 25 years. Um, we have strict protocols, and we've kept hundreds of people working for the last year and a half, but it's expensive. And one thing I don't hear, and maybe it's because it's before I joined up, but is there not an ability to do a widespread testing methodology like we do in show business, or perhaps stagger the participants, spectators, uh, allowing perhaps two week intervals where we have time to see if someone gets sick or not and time off with no spectators, then we can bring them back or some sort of version of understanding. It's not about two people or four or 50. If the COVID's in the room, it's in the room. And if people are gonna get it and they get the viral load, they're gonna get it, right? Um, whether you're vaccinated or not, you can get it, right? It's about taking the best steps we can. So what can we do some sort of higher level testing to mitigate, if we compromise, let's say we go two people or one, two, whatever it is, can we test more? Is it just a financial issue? Is it a, is it a social issue? What is the, where are we at with that in terms of the district and uh, what conversations might've been had before my time on more widespread testing and, and situations like this? Because that's what we do in, in Hollywood. It works incredibly well. So I, I just want to see, there is a motion on the floor and it's a, it's a very specific motion, um, but unless it gets pulled back, we should probably vote on that motion before we continue to have conversation about, about the broader topic. So, so Bryce, if I could just clarify, and I know Matt put it in the chat to just clarify. So the rec is planning on running um, first through sixth grade sports, not just fifth and sixth grade. Fifth and sixth grade is the only sport that we were considering games with at a minimal level. The rest would just be, you know, practices with the students and those in those volunteer coaches. Very few that are going to be doing it. I'm happy uh, to make to amend the motion to to include the the rec program, the the one Same. through six elementary. Yeah, I, I, my mistake for not including them in the first place, but I'm fully supportive of that. All right, so, so, so real quick, can we just, can we just uh, repeat the motion? I'm gonna call the question, we can, we can vote, you can vote yeah or nay, we'll, we'll move on. The conversation isn't stopping at this vote necessarily, right? Because we don't know what's gonna happen with it, but I wanna, I wanna go ahead and call this motion. So uh, the motion again, Bill. Oh, no. 
Uh, so I make a motion that we allow the uh, elementary school uh, K through six programs to proceed as outlined. We hold off on allowing outside spectators to sporting events until we have more data. We do allow our students uh, to come to the games um, as you know, as we've heard that they're they're desperately asking for that and for a mental need need that as well. So Brian, right, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna Brian, um, Brian, Brian, point of order, I guess is what I'm asking for. There was a motion on the floor. We're changing the motion. I don't want to have those that don't like the outcome or the whichever way it goes on the vote. Can we please? Get rid of that first motion before we move forward with the next motion. Can we get the one that made the motion say they withdraw and the one that said they seconded accept the withdrawal? I believe Bill's amending it as long as Adam is amiable to it since he's the one that seconded it. As long as Adam seconds that one then? I will second uh, second your, your amended motion. Thank you. All right, I'm, I'm going to just go to question on this uh, real quick. We have quite a few board members here, but do I have any opposed to the motion on the table right now? Just I'm opposed. Opposed. Okay, so, so that means we have to take a roll call vote. So that's, I'm going to go through, please yell at me if I miss anybody, and I'm going to apologize ahead of time, but I'm going to start with the, the room at the SU. Uh, let me... Uh, Can we get some clarification on which data we're looking to collect? Um, to make a decision moving forward? Are we yes. looking at rates within the school district or within the community? Uh, both, and then also the absenteeism. Received, thank you. So. Uh, Can I get some clarification? Yeah. Is this, are we voting on this as a, our recommendation suggestion? Or are we voting on this that this is something that needs to have to be changed by policy? The, the, the motion is for an action. So keep for that action. voting yes or no. Is it within our peer review to, to vote on this to have an action? Yeah. We, 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 we can. It's just not within uh, our it would, it would go against our previous our previous vote that we took that we took in August. Yeah, this goes against that goes against our what policies that we have in place now. We had the conversation at the beginning of the meeting. We're, we're gonna we're gonna take the roll call, guys. Just keep in mind that it would be a difference from what we've traditionally done. It is something that can be done, but right now we haven't even voted yet. So Matt, go ahead. I vote no. Uh, Carrie. No. Jim. Yes. Uh, Sam. No, because basically I feel like this is not within our purview to vote on and it goes against our past votes. So that's my main thing to say no on. Yep. Uh, Matt. Uh, Stout, sorry. Two, two Matt's now. Uh, no. No. Uh, Anna? I'm a no for the same reason Sam said. If this was a recommendation, I would support it. Uh, Adam? Yes. Uh, Todd? No. Bill? Yes. Bob? Oh. Dan? No. Josh? No. Um, am I missing anybody that's here? I'm sure. Oh, Sarah, sorry. Yes. Bryce, right, so I'm here. I'm still board member for January 1st. So, right. no. I, 
I mean, no. And you got the motion. And Ben. Oh, you hit the motion. It's already I got, I got, I got Ben. Um, anybody else that I missed? Sorry, it's hard to look through the look through the names quick, but all right. There's ten no's and six yeses or whatever. Yeah, so the, the no's have it. So no, no motion passing now. So right. I mean, I think I think that just you know, it's it's almost eight o'clock. There's obviously a conversation to be had. It doesn't sound like anybody wants to get to that point. I don't know. I'm going to allow just a couple more board comments. Um, just to share points of view for, for the administration, if you want. Um, but it sounds like we're, we're not ready to take any action, you know, action. Matt. so Matt, if you want to go ahead, Matt, and then Sam, and then Anna, kind of in the order you had your hands up. I still want to hear about the testing capacity. Okay. Cause I'm getting one. Do you want to, do you, do you want to speak to, to testing at all, Sherry? Just to clarify that, I don't know if. Right, so the testing that the test um, that we have available are for students and faculty. I would not, we don't have the resources that we're receiving from the state to test public at large. Um, and so that's why we were keeping it to mass and, and limiting the number of individuals coming to the games. Have we examined if we can get those resources and what it might take to do something like that? Or did you just dismiss it? Well, we've been working to keep the resources enough to test our students and staff, and that's been a challenge. So I, at this point, I don't even think the agency of ed who we're providing or Department of Health has tests available for the public right now. Even to get a test, you have to pay for it and your insurance company reimburses. So at this point, there are not free tests available through the Department of Health in Vermont. Okay. but. Just to just to belabor this point here, it's not that you're against testing, and maybe testing could be an option. It's a financial issue, but it's certainly not availability. We know we can get tests. Right. Financial issue is that the issue? Right. I don't have the authority or resources to purchase tests for individual fans, spectators coming to games. That is not something I've investigated. Right, but if we if we had tests. Can we make people take the tests no. to be part of the spectator pool? A random testing, something like this. Can we? Are we allowed to do that? I don't know. I can check into it. That would be great. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead, Matt. Um, I I like what uh, Todd suggesting. You know, potentially, if rapid tests were available, we would require those for anyone coming in. Um, but I, on the point of testing uh, and keeping kids in school, I can I can say that our test to stay program is effective. It is working. Um, you know, we've had a positives in classrooms, and that child goes home, and the remainder of the class can stay in school because of the test to stay program. Uh, and and we saw that across the elementary schools last week, multiple grades. Um, so I just, I wanted to allay of that concern slightly that we, we do have a program in place to test and keep kids in school. Um, and with that, that's, I'll end it with that on my comments. Okay, Anna and then Lou. I just wanted to say, I appreciate y'all, um, in having this discourse conversation. Um, thank you, Sherry, for all the work you've done. I hope that you've received a message. Uh, I look forward to to working more with y'all um, moving this forward. Thanks, Anna. Uh, Lou. Yeah, uh, and I think we don't exist, you know, in isolation here. You know, we exist in a town where we just had wassail and everything going on. There's people coming in. We're exposed to all sorts of things through our families and people that are working. I mean, this it isn't just us. And so I think, you know, shutting these things down is difficult to do. There's an aspect of mental health for students and parents that I think is important. I also think there's a lot of unintended consequences here, right? If you tell all these parents, and I'll use hockey parents as an example, that they can't come to home games, they're going to go to every single away game, every single parent. I don't know that that's the exposure we want to bring back in here. I think you're just going to drive the wrong activity. Take a very conservative, reasonable approach have fans in these games have these sports you know try to make life go forward as best we can thank you so um so with that guys it's eight o'clock 
Um, oh, Matt, you caught him. You caught me. I'll let you go ahead. Matt and Bill, and then we're going to be done. Hand to raise. I don't have a hand to raise because I'm sitting in here. I have a question to follow up on. I believe Matt Stout asked or a question about the uh, stay, the school. Has to stay. Is this available to three schools? No. No, because they're not five. Oh, okay. So, but, but, uh, so, so, to, but they're also, you know, they're also you asked the question, please let me answer. So as of last Thursday, they are investigating having tests to say it was not because the test is not available to them because of their age. It's because of resources that should be coming within the next week. Okay, but I'm just, I'm just making sure that someone had said that we have something in place for tests to stay, but those children, and I don't have, my youngest daughter is 19, but those students that are under five are not involved in the program. So maybe instead of waiting for the, the state to give us funding for testing those, I don't know how many students we have in pre-K, maybe we should take it upon ourselves to do the same for our preschoolers. I think it's ridiculous that the group that can't get tested, that can't get a vaccine, is not in this game. That's the part. If, if you told me that everyone in our school was getting tested, if everyone in our school is getting a vaccine, this would be a whole different conversation for me. But there's three-year-olds and four-year-olds, four years and 11 months old, that can't even get a vaccine or a test from us. Sorry, I'm done, Bryce. Just with this meeting, I'm not done. Did, did 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 I did I miss you, Matt? Do you have anything, or am I go move on to Bill? Go ahead, Bill. Yeah. So I I hope that a takeaway here is that if we're going to have a, a wholesale change of a policy, that there's a conversation before it actually goes out to the public, um, whether that be at a board meeting. But a heads up, other than hey, we did this, and it's different than what we have been doing and that we suggested we would do several weeks prior. That's it. Thanks, Bill. All right. With that, um, we will end this session and move into public comment for the couple of members of public if you want to